Today I'll be delivering my findings in the inquest into the disappearance and suspected death of Florabella Natalia Marion Ramical, known as Marion Barter, and who I'll be referring to as Marion. I'll just take appearances first. And please, the court, my name's Castleden. I appear assisting Your Honour. Thank you, Mr Castleden. If the court pleases, my name is Smith. I appear with Your Honour's leave for Sally Layden, the daughter of Marion Barter and her family. Thank you, Mr Smith. And please, the court, Your Honour, my name is Aldridge, and I appear with Your Honour's leave to appear on behalf of the petitioner of the New South Wales Police Force. Yes, thank you. Leave is granted. And I understand Mr White's on joining us by AVL. Uh, uh, yes, with Matt, please, the court, I'm appearing with Your Honour as leave for Mr Bloom. Yes, thank you, Mr White. As my full findings are very long, I'll be reading out a shorter summary today and the full version will be available after I close the inquest. First of all, I'd like to welcome Marion's family and friends who are joining us here in person or via the live stream today. I'd especially like to acknowledge Marion's daughter, Sally Layden, and Marion's son-in-law, Chris Layden, and her grandchildren. My thoughts are with you today. Some background. Marion was last sighted on the 22nd of June, 1997, when she was driven by a friend, Leslie Loveday, to a bus depot in Southport, Queensland, before departing on an extended overseas holiday. Prior to her disappearance, Marion executed a deed poll in the Supreme Court of Queensland legally changing her name to Florabella Natalia Marion Ramical. Marion did not disclose her new identity to friends and family. A passport issued to Florabella Natalia Marion Ramical on the 20th of May 1997 was re recorded as departing Brisbane Airport on the 22nd of June 1997 and returning also to Brisbane Airport on the 2nd of August, 1997. There has been no recorded contact with Marion since around the 1st of August, 1997, when she spoke with her daughter, Sally, on the telephone. Marion reportedly provided no indication to Sally that she intended to return to Australia on the 2nd of August. On the 22nd of October, 1997, Marion was reported missing by Sally at Byron Bay Police Station. The missing person report was made after Sally had received information suggesting that Marion had withdrawn funds from her bank account during the preceding two months, including several transactions in Byron Bay. Before I go any further, it's important to explain that an inquest is not a criminal case. The witnesses and agencies involved in an inquest are not on trial. It is not the role of the coroner to attribute blame or to punish anyone for Marion's disappearance. In fact, Section 81.3 of the Coroner's Act provides that when I deliver my findings, I must not indicate or in any way suggest that an offence has been committed by any person. Further, I am not to make findings of civil liability and I have no power to award compensation or damages. I now turn to the issues and my findings. I propose to only read the findings that I have made with regard to the issues that the inquest examined, along with the formal findings that I'm required to make and any recommendations. The written findings that will shortly be published set out in detail all of the findings I have made, the reasons for those findings and the evidence to support those findings. The first issue is whether Marion Barter departed Australia on the 22nd of June 1997 under the name of Florabella Natalia Marion Ramical. I find that Marion, under the name of Florabella, travelled overseas on the 22nd of June 1997. I find that, consistent with Sally's opinion, the handwriting on the outgoing passenger card was Marion's, except for the words Europe. Luxembourg and S. Korea, which were not written by Marion. I find that Marion deliberately 
travelled overseas using her new name and took steps to ensure that no family or close friend was aware of the change of her identity or the fact that she had left the country under the new name. The next issue is whether Marion Barter returned to Australia on the 2nd of August 1997 under the name of Flora Bella Natalia Marion Ramacol. I find that Marion returned to Australia under the name of Flora Bella Natalia Marion Ramacol on the 2nd of August 1997 and took steps to ensure that no one was aware of her return to the country. Marion's passport was never used again. I find that Marion did not leave Australia again after the 2nd of August 1997. The next issue is the circumstances in which Marion Barter disappeared in or around August 1997, including whether her disappearance was intentional and the possible reasons for her disappearance. I'll now turn to the issue as to whether Marion was last seen withdraw that. I'll now turn to the issue as to when Marion was last seen and whether her disappearance was intentional. I find that Marion was last sighted on the 15th of October 1997. I further find that as at the 15th of October 1997, Marion did not want her family and friends to know her whereabouts on that date. There is insufficient evidence, however, for me to be able to make a finding about her intentions after the 15th of October 1997. Rick Blum was a witness and an interested party in these proceedings. I make the following findings with regard to the role of Mr Blum in Marion's life. I will not set out all of my findings with regard to Mr Blum, just the pertinent ones. I find, find that the primary motivation for Mr Blum's name changes was in order to dishonestly represent himself to others and that Mr Bloom's weak explanation and denials in this regard should be wholly rejected. On the 10th of December 1994, Mr Bloom placed a personal advertisement in French in Le Courrier Australien under the name of MF Ramacol with an address of box L51 Lennox Head and a telephone number. I find that Mr Bloom could not satisfactorily explain why he opened and used a post office box at Lennox Head when he had one in Ballina, and that the only reasonable explanation for the listing of the post office box in Lennox Head and the telephone number for Ballina coin investments in the advertisement was in order for Mr Bloom to keep the advertisement and any response a secret from his wife and family. With regard to Mr Bloom's relationship with Marion in 1997, there is no documentary evidence available of any advertisement placed by Marion or Mr Bloom. I find that Mr Bloom's evidence was unsatisfactory and that contradictory accounts were given by Mr Bloom with regard to how he met Marion. In these circumstances, I'm unable to make a finding as to whether an advertisement was placed by Marion or Mr Bloom. I find that there is a sufficient basis to find that Mr Bloom met with Marion on at least three occasions between February and May 1997, but Mr Bloom's evidence is too unreliable for any further or more particular findings. With regard to the coincidence of Marion's change of name to Florabella Natalia Marion Ramacol and Mr Bloom's use of the name Fernand Nocolas Ramacol, I find that Marion changed her name to Florabella Natalia Marion Ramacol because she was in a relationship with Mr Bloom and sought to share a name with him. With regard to the coincidence of the timing and destination of Mr Bloom's travel to Europe in June and August 1997 and Marion's travel to England in June and August 1997, I find that based on the close proximity of the dates of travel, Mr Bloom's admission he travelled to England during the trip and the tendency and coincidence evidence relating to a number of other vulnerable women, Marion and Mr Bloom travelled together in England as a couple in a relationship for at least some period of the time when Marion was in England in 1997. 
with regard to the coincidence of Mr Bloom's access to the Hotel Nico Narita notepaper and Marion's use of Hotel Nico notepaper between the 22nd and 30th of June 1997, I find that Mr Bloom travelled to Japan at the relevant time and stayed at the hotel, obtained the notepaper and gave it to Marion in England. With regards to the coincidence of Marion's travel to Tunbridge Wells and Mr Bloom's association with Tunbridge Wells, whilst I find and have found that Marion and Mr Bloom travelled together in England as a couple in a relationship for at least some period of time when Marion was in England in 1997, there is insufficient evidence for me to find that Mr Bloom actually travelled to Tunbridge Wells with Marion in June or July 1997. With regards to whether Mr Bloom travelled with Marion to Rye, Hastings and Afriston, whilst I have found that Marion and Mr Bloom travelled together in England as a couple in a relationship for at least some period of time when Marion was in England in 1997, there is insufficient evidence for me to find that Mr Bloom actually travelled to Rye, Hastings and Alfriston with Marion in June or July 1997. With regard to the coincidence of Marion's purported residence as Luxembourg and Mr Bloom's close association with Luxembourg, I find that Mr Bloom, representing himself as Fernand Ramichel, suggested to Marion that they start a new life together in Luxembourg. With regard to the coincidence of Mr Bloom's application for a safety deposit envelope in October 1997, a day before Marion transferred $80,000 from her account, I find that there is a sufficient factual basis to make a finding that Marion withdrew the sums of money in August 1997 and transferred $80,000 to an unknown account in October 1997 on the encouragement of Mr Bloom and in circumstances where Marion believed she was in a relationship with him However, there is not enough evidence for a finding to the requisite standard as to whether and when Mr Bloom actually received some or all of Marion's money. With regard to the evidence of the use of Marion's money to start a school overseas, while certainly conceivable, such a finding is not supported by the evidence. With regard to the tendency evidence of Mr Bloom's dishonest relationships with vulnerable women, I find that the evidence of Jeanette Gaffney Bowen, Janet Oldenburg, Ghislaine Danois Dubois, Andre Flum, and Marie Landru demonstrates a tendency on the part of Mr. Bloom to misrepresent himself to single vulnerable women for financial gain. And further, I find that Mr. Bloom had a tendency to exploit vulnerable women. I also find that Mr Bloom exploited Marion in 1997 in the manner in which he later exploited other women who gave evidence in these proceedings. I make this finding despite Mr Bloom's denials in this regard and notwithstanding that the women involved in his later relationships remained alive and well. I find that Mr Bloom entered into a relationship with Marion in 1997 and encouraged her to start a new life with him. To this end, Marion changed her name, spent some time with Mr Bloom in England, and on return to Australia, represented herself as married to Mr Bloom, and demonstrated an intention to start a new life in Luxembourg with him. Mr Bloom travelled to England to spend time with Marion, when he clearly did not intend to pursue the relationship, because he was married with children and lived in Wollongbar, in New South Wales. I have made findings with regard to the evidence of each of Ms Gaffney Bowen, Ms Oldenburg, Ms Danois, Dubois, Ms Flum and Ms Landru. I will not read them out now as they are contained in my full written reasons, but I will say that I accept their evidence. Mr Bloom's evidence is of great importance in these proceedings. It is necessary for the court to assess his credibility. In short, I do not accept as accurate anything Mr Bloom has said in evidence in the absence of independent corroborating evidence. With regard to the role of Mr Bloom 
in the sale of Marion's house and Marion's decision to resign from the Southport School, I find that Mr Blum, whilst in an intimate relationship with Marion, persuaded or otherwise encouraged her to sell her house in 1997. The evidence is not sufficient to prove that Mr Blum played any causative role in Marion's decision to resign from her employment. With regard to the role of Mr Blum in the storage of Marion's tea chests at his house, I find that there is a sufficient factual basis for me to make a finding that Marion facilitated or otherwise agreed with a proposal by Mr Blum for him to take possession of some of her belongings before she travelled to Europe. I make this finding based on the stark similarities with the evidence of Ms Danois Dubois that in 2006 Mr Blum suggested and facilitated the packing and purported shipping of trunks of her possessions to Australia. However, I find Mr Blum's account of the storage of three or four tea chests and the existence of an unknown man in uniform who was planning to travel with Marion is implausible. With regard to whether Mr Blum played any role in Marion's life after she returned to Australia, there is a sufficient basis for me to make a finding that Mr Blum was in communication with Marion and played some role in her life following her return to Australia in August 1997. The further oral evidence and documentary evidence tendered in tranche five of the inquest held last year allows me to make further findings with regard to Mr Blum's further and undisclosed knowledge about his involvement with Marion in 1997. Mr Blum's evidence in the final days of the inquest, when asked by counsel assisting, would you like to say anything further in relation to the disappearance of Marion Barter, was extraordinary. This evidence, along with his lies and deception throughout the inquest, has convinced me that he does indeed know more than he is saying. I make the following further findings regarding Mr Blum. Firstly, that he has further knowledge about the circumstances of Marion's travel overseas. Secondly, that he has further knowledge of his relationship with her in the months prior to her disappearance. Thirdly, that he has further knowledge of her circumstances following her return from overseas. Fourthly, that he has further knowledge of the withdrawals and transfer of her money. And finally, that there is a sufficient basis for a finding that he was and is deliberately unwilling to divulge this further knowledge to the court. I now turn to the nature and adequacy of the police investigation into the disappearance of Marion by New South Wales Police between her disappearance in 1997 up until 2019, including whether it was conducted in an appropriately, I withdraw that, in an appropriate and timely manner and consistent with applicable policy and procedure. Having considered all the evidence tendered and the submissions made, I find that the nature and adequacy of the police investigation into the disappearance of Marion by New South Wales Police between her disappearance in 1997 up until 2019 was not adequate. It is clear from the evidence that following the initial report made by Sally to Byron Bay Police Station on the 22nd of October 1997, that very little was done to investigate Marion's whereabouts until approximately 10 years later in 2007. I find that the police investigation into the disappearance of Marion by New South Wales Police from the report on the 22nd of October 1997 up until 2007 was not conducted in an appropriate and timely manner and not consistent with the relevant policy in force within New South Wales Police at the time. I find that Detective Senior Constable Sheehan should not have reclassified Marion as located in 2011. The family made submissions that I should make 11 specific findings with regard to the police investigation. 
I have made six of the 11 findings proposed by the family as follows. One, that Graham Childs should not have classified Sally Layden's report made on the 22nd of October 1997 of her mother being missing as an occurrence only event and, then, and that it was inconsistent with the Commissioner's Instruction 39 being the relevant policy that governed missing persons reports at the time of Sally's report on the 22nd of October 1997. Two, that Graham Childs was unaware of the de definition of a missing person in Commissioner's Instruction 39, that he should have been aware of that document and that he classified the report as an occurrence only based on his own subjective view of the sense of urgency. Three, that it was unsatisfactory and inappropriate for Graham Charles not to have reclassified the event from an occurrence only to an active investigation in circumstances where he placed a warning in COPS at 2.52 p.m. on the 27th, 22nd of October 1997, 15 minutes after the first COPS record in which he had classified the report as an occurrence only at 2.37 p.m. Four, that as a result of failures at the first reporting of Marion Barter's disappearance, that her case was not investigated for almost 10 years until 2007, and that the failure to open investigation and the absence of an investigation in the following 10 year period has led to the unavailability of crucial evidence surrounding Marion's disappearance, which has resulted in Marion's disappearance remaining unsolved. Five, that Marion Barter was listed as a missing person for the first time in Ju on 6 July 2007 by Senior Constable Joanne Williams as a result of being contacted by Rebecca Cotts of the Australian Federal Police. Six, that Detective Senior Constable Sheehan's decision to recommend that Marion Barter be removed from the missing persons register on the 22nd of, October, of September 2011 and that the approval by the manager of the missing persons unit of that removal was incorrect and should not have occurred. That Marion should not have been classified as located in 2011 and that this was not consistent with the 2007 missing persons policies and procedures document which was applicable at the time and that the reclassification of Marion to located in 2011 meant that no further investigation was undertaken into Marion's disappearance for another five years, which had a further serious impact on the availability of evidence. Council Assisting made some comments at the oral address on the 27th of October, 2022, by way of reply in regard to the police investigation and the approach taken by New South Wales Police in that regard. I agree with the submissions of council assisting that I should make no criticism of Sally's actions at the time in 1997 or in 2007 or any time thereafter. Council assisting also submitted that there should be no suggestion that Sally has in any way delayed any investigation by New South Wales Police or behaved in a manner that can be described as anything other than understandable and consistent, with a daughter very confused and anxious at finding out about her mother's circumstances at the time. I accept and adopt council assisting submission. I would also add that Detective Chief Inspector Brown gave very clear and useful evidence to the court about what he expected should have happened in 1997. The resistance in this inquest by New South Wales Police to accept the inadequacies of the initial police investigation in 1997 is difficult to understand in circumstances where a senior police officer has given what is essentially expert evidence on what should have happened. I now come to the formal findings. As a result of having considered all of the documentary evidence, the oral evidence given at inquest and submissions, I find on the balance of probabilities that Flora Bella, Natalia, Marian Ramical, 
formerly known as Mariam Barter, is deceased. Pursuant to section 811 of the Act, I make the following findings in relation to the death of Florabella Natalia Marian Ramical, formerly known as Marian Barta. The person who died was Florabella Natalia Marian Ramical, formerly known as Marian Barta. While I am unable to determine the exact date of death, I find that Marian is likely to have died on a date after the 15th of October 1997. I am unable to determine the place of Marian's death. I'm unable to determine the cause of Marian's death. I'm unable to determine the manner of Marian's death. Pursuant to section 82 of the Coroner's Act, coroners may make recommendations connected with a death. Marian's remains have not been found and the available evidence does not allow me to make findings as to the possible cause and manner of Marian's death. However, the circumstances surrounding Marian's disappearance are troubling. Accordingly, I make the following recommendation to the New South Wales Commissioner of Police. I recommend that the New South Wales Commissioner of Police cause the investigation into the death of missing person Florabella Natalia Marian Ramical, formerly known as Marian Barter, to be referred or to remain within the State Crime Command Unsolved Homicide Team for ongoing investigation, review and monitoring. The family submitted that the court should formally refer Mr Blum to the Director of Public Prosecutions or the Attorney General to consider charges of either perjury or making a false statement. The family submitted that the court may make such a referral in the absence of any express statutory power under the Act pursuant to the court's implied powers. I am of the view that any referral of Mr Blum to the Director of Public Prosecutions or the Attorney General to consider charges of perjury or false statements on oath is a matter best left for the police investigators, particularly considering the investigation has not concluded. On the 25th of June 2021, the New South Wales Government, together with the New South Wales Police Force, announced a reward of $250,000 for information which leads to the arrest and conviction of any person or persons responsible for Marion's disappearance. On the 27th of April 2022, the New South Wales Government, together with the New South Wales Police Force, announced that the reward had been increased to 500000 when the reward increased as it was announced on the 27th of April 2022, Detective Inspector Nigel Warren said that any new information regarding Marion's disappearance would be welcome. I strongly encourage any member of the public who has any information relating to the disappearance of Marion Barter or information relating to Florabella, Natalia, Marion Ramical to come forward and to share that information with New South Wales Police. More recently, evidence was gathered and tendered in these proceedings from the New South Wales Police, the New South Wales Forensic and Analytical Science Service and Queensland Forensic Science Scientific Services. This evidence establishes and confirms that investigating police have obtained DNA, a DNA sample from Sally this DNA profile has been uploaded to the New South Wales and national DNA databases for continuous searching against any DNA profile recovered from unidentified deceased persons in order to identify a biological parent-child relationship. This means that the DNA profile of Sally will remain on the New South Wales and national DNA databases and will be searched against all unidentified deceased profiles every day. In closing, I'd like to acknowledge and commend Sally on her unwavering commitment and participation in the coronial investigation and inquest to find out what happened to her mother. She has shown fortitude, dignity, resilience and grace throughout these proceedings. 
I express my sympathy and condolences to Sally, Chris, Bronwyn, Deirdre, Lee, Marion's grandchildren, Marion's family, friends and loved ones, and the many people that Marion touched in her life. I would like to again acknowledge that the experience of grief for the family of a missing person is complex and difficult, and there remain many unanswered questions. I would like to acknowledge the tireless work carried out by the investigators from New South Wales Police. Detective Inspector Nigel Warren, Detective Sergeant Sasha Panazza, and Detective Senior Constable Lisa Pizzotto, and express my gratitude for their ongoing assistance throughout the coronial investigation and inquest. I would also like to acknowledge and thank my council assisting team, Adam, council, Adam Castledon, Senior Counsel, Tracy Stevens and Clara Pataki. They have dedicated an enormous amount of time and commitment to the preparation and conduct of this inquest and have provided tremendous assistance to me. I also thank the legal representatives for the interested parties for their cooperation and assistance during these proceedings. Finally, I would like to conclude by acknowledging and recognising the person that Marion was to her family, friends and loved ones. The witnesses who provided statements and evidence at the inquest described Marion as a loving and caring person who had a fondness for antiques and the arts, could easily make friends and who was also a gifted teacher. It is fitting to end with the words shared by Sally to the court, reading from the family statement, the statement in which she described Marion as a kind, caring soul with a wicked laugh. She was intelligent, she was cultured, and she had so many friends who loved and miss her still. She would always bring you flowers or a cake. She was a very generous human. I close this inquest. Thank you, Lisa.